a shallow grave. Okay, so if that's the head. A highway accident leads to gunfire. And Navajo cops track a dying man across the empty desert. We don't know where he's at. He's on his head! 70,000 square kilometers of the Wild West. Spread out across three states. This is the largest Indian reservation in North America. And these are the Navajo cops. the interstate, Navajo police respond to a disturbing call. It's a yellow one. Put of the RP, there was blood inside that bag also. The um, initial call was a suspicious bag reported by a female. The bag contained some gloves and what appeared to be blood inside the bag. On a reservation that straddles three states and 13 RP. counties, uh, RP's at the residence. Navajo officers must work closely with local and federal police. Uh, there's a shoe track. Right now, it uh, just looks that way. I'm Apache County sent the deputy out here. He secured the scene, took some initial information from the reporting person. They checked the area. It appears to be a grave of some sort. The body's right here. You can see tire tracks heading in. Having me with us at this location, it is a shallow grave. Okay, we'll be here. She checked the area further, and she's seen the shallow grave nearby. So that, I guess, raised hairs on her back and called it in. Hair? Yeah. It looks like hair, but it's just mainly the top of it. Yeah. Don't know what it is. Cyrus! Yeah, we will. This one? Okay, so if that's the head. 80 kilometers away, in Window Rock, Arizona, Officer Christopher Holgate is beginning another night on the graveyard shift in the Navajo Nation's capital. Everything happens at night. Lately, things have been getting worse. We've been getting a lot of uh, people with weapons, uh, any type, knives, um, uh, guns. So you just always have to be cautious on what could happen. 15. Dispatch asks Holgate to back up a traffic stop for an erratic driver. Driver, turn off the vehicle! Driver! Officer lit him up as he failed to stop over there while making a left turn. Uh, sure enough, when we pulled up on scene, passenger side door open automatically. Drop the bottle! Give me a hand. Give me a hand. Well, he refused to comply automatically, so I see he got out. We take him down. Don't know if he's going to use that bottle, try to throw it at us. So we had to take him down. Give me a hand. I gave him a hand last week. Ow. Come on up. Back faster, Come coming out. Back faster. Stay right there, man. I'm not. Driver, come on out, man. I'm here, I am. Come on out. Put your hands up there. Put your hands up there. Put your hands up there. Holgate arrests the driver. Bring your arm back for me. Not just for drunk driving, but for possessing alcohol. Liquor is illegal everywhere on the reservation. How much would you drink today? I just drink a can and a half. Can and a half? Bring them, belly bro. We arrested the driver and the back passenger. Uh, both of them are compliant, and both of them are arrested for outstanding warrants. The front passenger, stand up, stand up. he wasn't as compliant. I call on tobacco. Put your leg across that panel. I call on tobacco, sir. Come this way, get in. Relax, dude. Put your leg in. 
Put your leg in. You can see why well, he's uncooperative. Put your leg in. Highly intoxicated. Put your leg in. Gave him several times to get in, I'm get in, but he was time. resistant. Do it, Didn't want to get in. I'm going to tell you one more time. If you don't do it, I'm going to tase you. Get in, bro. He's going to do get it. Get in, dude. Just get in, man. One more time. Put your leg in. One more get time. In, one more time, then I'll get him. Get Told him he'd get tased. I kept telling him over and over. One more time, then I'll get him. Sure, sure enough, I had to tase him. One more time, then I'll get him. Get in, man. Okay. Uh, I'm going to get Put your leg in. You're kill me, this. It's a good tool to use, good tool to have. They know what the taser is, they know what it feels like, and it's an effective tool that we have. For us officers here, we have to make sure that we go home safely and whatnot, but like I said, it's just getting worse. Back at the Window Rock Police Station, Officer Filbert Toddy puts in time at the police gym before starting duty. That's how I relieve a little bit of my stress as I work out. This job, it's very, very stressful, you know, and it's also physically demanding, so that's part of the thing that I do consider is that the people do entrust us to get the job done. Prior to this, I served four years in the United States Marine Corps. I did that because, you know, I wanted to make a difference. And then I joined up with the, uh, the police to continue that. Toddy's first call of the evening, Copy. a burglary. I'm glad you came out here and saw this, you know, because this is the way out here. I have no electricity. Mm -hmm. This guy has a whole list of things that were taken. He's missing a saddle, a compound hunting bow, a knife, and some firearms. So these thieves were very particular about what they took. Nothing missing from here, right? Nothing from this side. I, I checked it. But most of the stuff was taken from here. And then I had that boom and knock that I was telling you about. It was sitting right here. And that was gone. I was going home later. My sister was coming down, and I stopped her, and I told her, I said, hey, somebody broke into my house. I said, oh, my man, these things are gone. And the funny thing about it was, one of the items I was missing was sitting in the back of her seat in the car. Who is this again? Uh, my sister, Fallon. OK, OK. That's your sister, huh, my... Fallon? When he told me that his sister did steal from him, it upset me a lot. Our culture is based on family connection, family ties. So when you steal from another relation, you know, that goes against the teaching and the beliefs that we have. The thief also made off with several firearms. There's a lever action, 22 long rifle, uh -huh. that small caliber, 30-30, yeah. and a, a, an SKS. Wow, so those are unknown. Those are her daughter. We finally got the chance to talk to her. Mm -hmm. And she said they pawned those rifles to pay for rent. The individual here provided me a statement of some listing of the items that we're selling at a yard sale. And it's pretty much in, you know, matching up with what he gave me of what he's missing from his residence here. According to his statements that were received, this gal's been doing it for quite some time. We're going to be pulled up to the location right here off the highway here. I'm going to make my initial contact with her get her first story, answer some questions. The house is dark. The curtains are not full. There might be someone in there, but they're not willing to answer the door. I have no one at that first house. Toddy has another lead to follow up the victim's other sister. So my next stop is I'm going to go down the road, meet with the other sister, and talk to her. Hello, police officer. Are you Velma? 
Uh, I'm also tied with the one of PD. Is our lender around? Could you take him back here? Uh, on an investigation, I'm doing right now on a burglary that occurred up here at his residence. What could she be? She should be home. I just came from there, and there's no one home. There's no one answering. I don't really um, communicate with her. Okay, but this is her car right here, right? Yeah. There's a TV and then um, some tools in the back seat. If you do come into contact with her verbally, uh, let her know that I need to talk to her. And if she doesn't want to be linked in my investigation, the best contact me at the Windrow Police Department. I don't know what the problem is here. Maybe it's a drug habit. Maybe she's just in need of money. But it goes against our beliefs and our culture. So what this gal is doing is upright wrong. So this is me off, you know, that she's doing this to her family. All right, thank you so much. <clears throat> Apparently, I guess these sisters make an arrangement to sneak out of town, preferably Albuquerque. She is aware of our presence and our investigation going on against her. So, pretty much not the result I'm looking for. So, the thing I can only do right now is just write this up and conduct follow ups and build a case on it. On the return trip to Window Rock, Toddy gets a call about a single vehicle accident. We yeah, respond to a one vehicle collision involving an animal with injuries. My sergeant on scene right now as well as the ambulance, so. No airbag. There is blood on the door on the There's multiple victims here, including the driver as well as the kids, so. Let's check on the update and status of the children first and get back conducting our investigation on this one here. The cause of the accident is rare on most American highways and fairly common on the reservation. A collision between a car and a wild Mustang. Okay, we got a large brown horse here. Did y'all? Also strike the animal? No? No, we just were right behind her when she Okay, okay. Yeah, just stand by her. Okay. What occurred here was the uh, folks right here, this mother and her kids were going southbound on this highway. And according to her, she was being alerted by oncoming morse of those animals on the roadway until the very last moment. That's when she realized that she struck this animal here. Okay, sweetheart, I'm going to roll you to your side and I'm going to check your back. I'm going to pull up your shirt, okay? The injured are being stabilized. The witnesses were checked and are safe. The horse is in pretty bad shape. It has a shattered leg and possible internal injuries. The animal right now is trying to get up and cross onto the highway again. So right now I'm gonna to have to do something to prevent the animal from causing another traffic collision. I advise everybody, I wanna discharge around. In some places, there may not be too many vehicle crashes involving animals, but out here, it's fairly common. Navajo police officer Filbert Toddy has cleared the wreckage. Three people have been evacuated by ambulance. But Toddy has one more task as the badly injured horse tries to get back on its feet. Just let you know that I might have to discharge my firearm, okay? So if you can turn the vehicle up, close the windows, keep the kids inside, okay? We had to put down the animal since it was severely injured and start making his way back from the dirt shoulder back into the highway here. I want to have to shoot this animal. It's climbing back on the roadway here. Tell these folks to clear out right now. The animal was obviously suffering, and I have to think about the public safety when we have a wounded animal on the highway. About killing an animal like this, 
it's tough. 80 kilometers away. Officer Wendell Bitsilli continues to investigate the discovery of a bag of bloody gloves and a shallow grave. FBI is underway. Criminal investigations, too, they're going to pretty much just shut down this whole scene. If, let's say, it doesn't pan out to be a homicide, then it would become a major crime. That's where FBI would have jurisdiction. Hello. How's it going? <laughs> What's going good? A female FBI agent arrives, and the county sheriff's deputy has made another disturbing discovery at the grave. Right where the light's at? Yeah. It appears to be a skull sticking out right here, partially exposed. According to the RP, there's a yellow bag that was over here. Uh -huh. There's looks like blood inside the plastic bag there. She wants us to kind of scrape the area for confirmation. I guess there was an agent, FBI agent right now. She checked out the little scene we have and she's getting instructions from other her other coworkers to see which way to go about it. So we're still waiting on confirmation. She's probing it using some markers to see what the length of the object that's buried underneath the ground is there. It does appear to be shallow grave with hair or scalp, you can see it. And as the rains more, more of that can be seen and more visible. There's a skull on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. If it's the head, it's kind of like on the south end there, then the, the feet will be this way. Next step for us is we get a hold of criminal investigations. Hours later, an FBI specialist arrives and begins to carefully exhume the corpse. Still got your camera? Based on Navajo belief, it's a negative to be around any type of human remains. It's just a bad omen, taboo. In Navajo speaking, they say, no Don't touch it, don't look at it, don't be around it. Look at that. After painstaking work, the FBI agent gets his first clear look at the corpse. See? Humans don't have that much hair. <laughs> That's a dog. You smell that? That don't even smell like that. Well, I'm relieved right now because the shallow grave ended up to be a dog. See all that right there? That's a dog. It's still a homicide. Homicide. <laughs> I'm glad it's not a human body. It could have been worse. We can all go back to work now. By dawn, in the rangelands near the tiny town of Steamboat, Arizona, a traditional backcountry custom is underway. A wild Mustang roundup. Ronald Key leads this roundup, a Navajo old-timer who spent most of his life on horseback. The Navajo Nation has a lot of feral horses. Uh, they migrate, they graze off the, the, the land. But to Navajo Ranger Daryl Billy, this roundup may be a crime. We had a 
anonymous caller that called in reporting a illegal roundup in Steamboat area. The trail boss's roundup may be a centuries old tradition, but unless he has a permit, he's breaking the law. This individual's permit has expired. We've known this guy, we've seen some livestock from him. We've continued trying to work with him, but he still refuses to cooperate. Sergeant Aurelia Nez of the Navajo Rangers arrives at the scene. <laughs> Rangers are the backcountry version of a SWAT team, patrolling the last vestiges of the Wild West. Right now, we're calling this an illegal roundup. We don't have documents. Uh -huh. OK, who, who, who's all the owners of the branded horses? There's some of them are here. Some? Uh, yeah. What about the rest of them? They have to have a permit in order for them to buy livestock on the reservation. If they don't have that, they can't even come onto the reservation to buy. Each owner needs to tell us how many horses they have in there. There are a lot that they're there. There's no fresh brand. No, 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 no. That's what I mean. That's not what I mean. It's the key. Listen to me. Yeah. Notify the people that whoever is going to sell the horses, uh. they need, you need to separate them like you do you have in here. The one that we don't many, sell? How many the do whole, you have in the here? Whole load, the whole load. I don't know. We haven't caught yeah. them yet. Like 100 and like Maybe 100. At least 150. So. Okay. So because we need to, we need to do the paperwork on all of it. They're gonna go ahead and verify brands, and then count up all the horses that they have in there. Some of them might be stolen. Each horse in this illegal roundup must be corralled to check for its brand to see if it's stolen. The problem is more than simply a lack of permits. Backcountry roundups can be a cover for horse thieves. Yeah, stay back there. The, the kids and the grandkids, they have jobs off the reservation. They're not here to account for their livestock. Did this guy give a consent? to have their livestock be sold? Or did they give consent to their uncle to sell their livestock? You know, we have a lot of that nowadays. Rangers and cowboys work together to check 150 horses. Accidents happen. After checking every single horse, the rangers discover that only 60 of them have brands or paperwork. The other 90 horses may be captured illegally or stolen. With no way to tell if the unbranded horses are stolen, the rangers have only one option. If we don't identify who the owner is, then we'll just go ahead and let him out. 90 wild horses run free again into the backcountry. With his profits galloping away, trail boss Key may not be happy, but it could have been worse. Uh -huh. If he didn't talk to me, this man right here would have been in cuffs uh -huh. and on his way to jail. He's just over there saying, we don't need documents. No, you need the document for it. You need to have the permit. Well, I hope this has taught him a lesson, but I don't know if it has. We do have 90 horses that were released back out into the field. He might come back. We'll see what happens. To many elders like the old trail boss, official oversight goes against Old West tradition and ancient Navajo culture. Oh, they said, well, the ancestors see what the, their stories from the beginning. I said, you know, this is how it's supposed to be. It's nothing really changed. I think they're the ones that changed it. Not me. <laughs> 100 kilometers away, 
Officer Genevieve Morgan is on the road, pursuing an urgent call at a domestic dispute and suicide attempt. I guess they're arguing with each other, and every time they argue, that's when he wants to go um, kill himself. And he takes off. Right now, we're not too sure where that guy should be at. Morgan discovers the suicidal man fled into the desert after taking three bottles of pills. Her only hope now is to track him down before the pills and the desert heat cause him to pass out. Arizona's brutal desert heat kills over 100 people every year. The tennis shoe track. Tennis shoes? Tennis shoe track. Tracking is an ancient Navajo skill, honed by hunters and warriors over generations. And with 70,000 square kilometers of desert and wilderness to patrol, police officers must be familiar with it. Morgan notices a curious second set of footprints. The one that comes back down is actually small prints. The big one, it doesn't go any further right there. The situation is grave enough that the dispatcher sends Officer Filbert Toddy to assist. This is the one, the back road that is going to link up with the officer on scene. So we'll be looking for green shirt, jeans, and tennis shoes. Hello, looking for a guy, green t-shirt, gray pants. He's wandering around the area, so we need to find him, okay? okay. We don't know what the individual's capable of. You know, we have kids that are running around. We're gonna have to get this situation resolved. While Officer Toddy pursues the missing man from one direction, Officer Morgan has run into a dead end. There's no really footprints that anybody walked out. Just those, those horses. I hardly see any footprints. And you don't see anybody. It's gone. It's not real. But Morgan is about to get a shock. Oh, that's them. Officer Morgan radios Toddy to report her sighting of the missing man. You see him? Silbert. The figure turns out to be Officer Toddy, tracking the man from the other direction. He was over here. <laughs> okay, how far from here did you conduct your search? Huh? How far from here? From the residence, we didn't go. We, um, we're just coming up this way. The officers split up again, searching for the lost trail. As they realize they're losing time. The individual here has a good head start on us. He walked off in this general area here. Obviously, it's a rugged terrain. He took quite a few medication, three bottles in total. So let's see if we get to him as soon as we can. Render immediate medical assistance. Officer Toddy is the first to pick up the trail. Stand by, I found the tracks. Okay, the tracks are leading towards the old abandoned structures right east of the well. Toddy uncovers another mystery revealed by the tracks. When we follow the tracks, it obviously is, is like certain areas that there's multiple shoe prints, like there was a verbal confrontation, all of a sudden, you know, there's scuffing, you know, it seemed like a shuffling match going on. Yeah, and it continues on. The mystery has only deepened. We can't find him. We don't know where he's at. Until he surfaced somewhere, we might be able to actually have him get checked. We really don't have anything to go by now. Just then, Toddy gets a radio call from non-native sheriff's deputies. Well, that's an interesting twist. It's got information that the individual was already encountered by a county deputy, and 
he was released. So our subject that we're looking for uh, is that he's possibly with another individual. He's coherent, so the officer that's doing his investigation is going to gather more. We'll render any additional assistance if she needs it. Sergeant Aurelia Nez of the Navajo Rangers drives to a police livestock lot east of Window Rock. I had one of my officers that was doing an investigation this morning on a, a livestock theft. And um, she was able to impound two cattle. Just like in the days of the Old West, cattle rustling remains common on a reservation where many families still rely on livestock for their survival. Nez arrives on the scene in the middle of an arrest. I guess the owner reported saying that her cattle were penned up somewhere in the mountain. See, these cattle have a state brand and they do not belong to him. He doesn't have ownership documents. He doesn't have a brand card, grazing permit, nothing that, says, that ties these cattle to him. The actual owner arrives at the lot. It turns out she is the suspect's own cousin. I cannot believe he would do such a thing. You know, if, if somebody sold it, I don't know. I would never guess who took it. OK, uh, be at it. Navajo police officer Wendell Bitsilly arrives to help with the arrest. I guess the rangers themselves were able to make an arrest. They just need a law enforcement officer present during the situation that they're handling at the time here. Navajo rangers are not allowed to transport suspects to jail. This means they must work closely with their comrades in the Navajo PD. You understand what's going on here, right? Yeah, but, it, uh, but it, I don't think I'm guilty. <laughs> okay. I don't know the circumstances yeah. other than you've been arrested by the rangers yeah. for livestock theft. Okay. Yeah. Um, Whatever creatures you brought in, so forth, I, I don't know about that. Right now, they just need our assistance from the oh. Naval Police Department is to relay you to the detention facility in Wonder Rock. Okay. okay. With the rustler in custody, the rangers search his vehicle. Well, they found a uh, pistol magazine that's on the dashboard there. And they also found some rifle ammunition. So they're searching the vehicle for uh, any weapons now and they also found some alcohol. So it looks like uh, they're probably gonna have some additional charges for possession. Basically just relaying the guy to the jail here, along with his property and arrangements were made to contact someone of his choice to pick up the vehicle. But um, it's more likely the detention based on their, their lack of space, well, just you know, book him in, assign him a court date, and sent him on his way and he can go back to work. The suspected cattle rustler is booked into the Window Rock Jail and almost immediately released. Since he wasn't intoxicated and was cooperative, they went ahead and just released him on his own for cognizance right now. So he's a free man. He's got a scheduled court date in a couple weeks, so he's got to return then. Nearby, Officer Leroy Wilson runs across a strange sight on the remote highway. A near totaled vehicle, window smashed, driving on its rims. I was traveling southbound. I seen this vehicle going northbound, and it's all messed up. The car refuses to stop. Too far high, I see the coat tree all be northbound from here. Fortunately, Wilson gets back up as Officer Genevieve Morgan appears. Forty-three, one out, It takes two officers with guns drawn to bring the suspect out of the car. The driver is compliant, but gives no logical explanation for the condition of his car. 
He said that I ran to a tree two days ago. <laughs> Doesn't look like two days yep. ago. And I said, Don't, you have all those blood on you and you can't be bleeding for two whole days. Yeah. 12 years I've been in law enforcement. I never seen a vehicle this damaged on a highway. Both right tires are on the rim. The door was open like the way it is on the passenger side. And so he must have been involved in a vehicle crash somewhere. Why is he still driving around like that? <laughs> What's your name? Irvin. Where did you get in an accident? The driver finally admits he was drinking and that he had two passengers who have disappeared. Morgan heads out to find the scene of the accident. He said he did have two passengers inside the vehicle. There's um, a sister and a brother-in-law that were in there, and he doesn't remember after they crashed. If they left from there, they're still there. Morgan must now find the missing passengers and see if there are any survivors. The driver of the ruined vehicle is taken in for booking and a blood alcohol test. Urban, 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 ready? All right, let's go. Deep breath. Close our again. The driver's blood alcohol level is well over the limit and a disturbing call has come into the station. Who who is it? Before before the highway? I think so, yeah. Oh, I hope it's not my sister. Who is it? Did you tell me? Do you know who it is? Is that people or male? I don't know. You know who you're with? Sister. <laughs> Officer Genevieve Morgan continues to search for the passengers who were flung out of the speeding car. At this point, she's not sure if they're dead or alive. But there's no sign of any victims. You better not be my little sister. At the jail, the driver fears that he has killed his only sister in the drunken rollover. Officer Tom! Yeah! Yeah! on the main road? Back near the scene of the accident, Officer Morgan runs into Filbert Toddy, who has discovered two young people behaving suspiciously I located these two individuals in the middle of nowhere. Obviously, you know, the situation doesn't appear normal. So after confirming with Officer Morgan, I think we found our passengers. OK, so you guys are the passengers. We found Irving's pretty bad. No, we're not, we're not passengers. Oh, my god. What happened to him? What happened to him? He was involved in a rollover. Who? Oh. Irving. Irving who? By himself? The mysterious couple claim they don't know anything about an accident. She's claiming that uh, they got jumped. Um, no, so. Were you in a vehicle when the accident happened? No, but go up to that house and ask them, huh, baby? We got jumped from these guys that came from Junior. And then the suspect contradicts herself, as she claims she's never met the driver, then seems very concerned about his safety. Is he OK? Go, go up to that house and drive okay. him. 
The couple's alibi falls apart under Toddy's questioning. Okay, so you all came here with Irvin, right? Yes. In that little gray car? Yes. Mm -hmm. We walked out that way because they were still running after us. We found out that these three individuals were involved in a fight. In the midst of the whole altercation, weapons were drawn and yeah, possibly shots were fired. So in the midst of the whole confusion, the driver, along with the occupants, fled from here, in which you know, the driver was driving erratically, recklessly, at a high rate of speed, it caused the vehicle to roll over, and somehow, miraculously, all the occupants survived. The mystery has been solved. The passengers face charges of disturbing the peace. The driver faces a DUI charge and the lifelong knowledge that he nearly killed his own sister. He's fortunate he can see another day. Actually, I should say it's fortunate they can see another day, all three of them. One hundred twenty kilometers away, outside the tribal capital of Window Rock. Officer Christopher Holgate arrives at the scene of a domestic dispute. Yelling all the time. That goes, sir. Jail, don't drive. Any reason why you're yelling, Mr. Sanchez? Lady called in on her uh, husband. So we arrived, and you know, he was in the bedroom, and so he was sitting down. The wife tells Holgate she's afraid the man will turn violent and Holgate starts to take the man in. What they say, what I did. Well, they said you were just yelling and whatnot, just okay. yelling, that was it. OK, I do yell, you know. Yeah. But when I'm drinking, I'm sober, mm -hmm. no matter what. I understand that, sir. But like I said, you're not arrested, but I'm just going to take you to NCI with a... No, I don't need to. It, it's do a... I need to? Yeah, I have to, sir. Okay. But this simple domestic dispute is about to turn into a major headache for Officer Holgate. Uh, watch your arm, sir. Said that he was uh, Chicano, you know, which would be a non-native, which we can't hold in our jail system. Sir, if I have a non-native, she wants you to go to jail, but I told her that you being a non-native, which you're a Chicano, we, we can't hold you in our jail system here in Winter Rock. Okay, okay. So there's no... There's this no domestic problem. fight becomes a jurisdictional nightmare. Chef, I have a non-native Joe. Tribal law covers only American Indians, not non-natives. All right, just sit tight. I'll be right back, OK? Reservation police can arrest non-natives, but they can't jail them. He has no relatives nearby. we we'll have to take him to a place where, you know, just for his safety. Sadly for Holgate, this may mean a long night. There's about 13 different counties across the Navajo Nation. And once we arrest the non-native, it's my job to take him to the nearest sheriff department. Even if it's like 200 miles away, we still have to take him there because we can't hold him in our jails. It's kind of hard for me. It pulls me away from my shift, which leaves my shift shorthanded. And sometimes even just driving there could take a whole shift. And by the time we get back, our shift is done. Maybe even quick. 70 kilometers away. Uh, okay. Officer Philbert Toddy gets a call that reopens an earlier mystery. The suicidal man who was found by sheriff's deputies earlier in the day has fled into the desert again. The um, individual that we're seeking ran out the resident in the southeastern direction once the telephone call was placed by the mother. So how was he? Avoiding us. To Toddy's surprise, the subject's wife refuses to talk to police. But a neighbor provides disturbing details. He said he's been taking pills. Oh, really? Yeah. What kind exactly? I don't know. Okay. He said he took 36. Wow. The family lost him down here in the same area, the steep ravine. That's very hard because we're not too familiar with this area, you know, as compared to he is, so he knows every, you know, hill, tree, whatever, you know, place that he can conceal himself. Uh, just for the wolf.
With three bottles of pills in him, the man may not have much time before collapsing. Boys are broken. This one? Okay, I can take it. 43. I don't know if it's broken or cracked. No. I got a subject here. How do you turn 55? Subject has a dislocated knee. You treat me rough again like you did. Oh, Different. Should be running, right? I wasn't running, I'm hiding. Oh, you should be hiding. <laughs> We're looking for you, partner. What about the medication about earlier? What's the deal with that one? No? You wait, stay awake there. I'm asking you questions. How did this happen? You're late. While Toddy waits for assistance, a surprising story emerges. The man is suffering from more than just an overdose. Oh, okay. So this was kind of a little bit of a disagreement between both. So my head. Uh huh. Both legs. The man claims his spouse has hit him with a baseball bat, possibly breaking his leg. I located some tracks around here. It appeared that there has been a struggle that occurred. The extent of his injury to his leg is unknown. OK, we're going to make our way slowly back to the house, OK? we got the ambulance coming around to check you up, all right? So I was able to take him into custody render medical assistance and have the ambulance check him out for any further psychological evaluation or any further physical injuries that he may have sustained. After a full day of tracking and capturing the elusive subject, it's not clear if a crime has even been committed. What is clear is that a life has been saved. It's very fortunate we found him and it turned out to be a productive evening. There's no greater challenge than to be a police officer to go out there, risk your own life to save another. Our primary objective is to restore peace and protect you know, life and property. Hopefully the public does realize that we're here for them. There's nothing else I would rather do than remain a police officer.